Good evening and uh, welcome to this, the uh, second and last um, mini conference of the 2021 se uh, se season um, and uh, on Rails to the Catskills, a uh, documentary film made by to Toby Carey, who is here to talk to us about, about the film. And uh, first we're going to um, talked with Susan Sprackman a moment to describe how the question how the question and answer period is going to work. So Su Susan, if you would like to uh, take over. Sure. Um, the, the videos are going to be shown. They're going to be four segments of varying lengths. Um, and we thought we'd have a Q&A session, a short one in between for questions that relate just to the particular segment and those sessions will be like maybe five or six minutes and then at the end of the um, presentation we can have a longer discussion um, at the bottom of your screen there's a place where you can raise your hand i'm just looking to see where it is um the reactions button if you click oh, the, the reactions reaction. button yeah at, at the reactions button the bottom towards the right um, and uh, you can raise your hand that way. And um, if you can't get through that way, just sort of go like this and, and I'll, I'll find you. Um, and um, I think that's it. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So um, I'm sure that many of you who are on this evening uh, know to Toby uh, from various presentations. I've, I've had the privilege to hear him a few times. Um, he has been working in, in the Valley for a long time. He's done um, the documentaries on the Esopus Creek, on the Gomez uh, Mill House, on John Van Vanderlyn, uh, the one which I first saw was Deep Deep Water, uh, but also the Hudson River, the PCB story, and many more. He's uh, also very active uh, filming political things in and around uh, Ulster Ca County, so it's a privilege re really for me to introduce him and uh, to have him dis describe the uh, uh, rails uh, to the Catskills. Good evening, to Toby. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. Nice to be here. Nice to see some uh, old friends and some new ones as well. Uh, it's always a pleasure to do something with the Historic Society. Uh, we uh, Tonight, uh, I've been asked to show uh, portions of Rails to the Catskills, which is a 93-minute program. Uh, so I, I picked four different segments. Um, and I think they'll be of interest. They kind of follow along the trajectory of, of the story, at least part of it. Uh, and I, I hope you'll be able to uh, follow along, even though it's not totally sequential. Uh, there's some parts left out of the story, of course. And it's a big story. Uh, I was reluctant to do this film for many years. My wife, Meg, who's been my co-producer on a lot of my, my history films, uh, asked me, she said, well, you know, railroads are very popular. There are a lot of people who like them. Uh, why don't you consider doing something about them? And I knew it was a very big project and I was reluctant to undertake it. And so I delayed doing it for some years and then uh, did some uh, quicker uh, projects in between. Um, if you call doing something, it takes a year to do a quicker project. But this took over three years to put together because it's the way I do my work is I, I pretty much uh, am a one-person band, if you will, and work in and around uh, paying jobs. So I do it as a labor of love uh, and put it out uh, in whatever media is current. Of course, this was originally done uh, as a DVD, and uh, they still are available, but now things are shifting pretty quickly to streaming, so we're available uh, and those formats as well. So to jump into the uh, Rails of the Catskills, um, it's, as I said, uh, a DVD uh, that has 12 chapters to it. And the first question that always comes up, or at least came up to me, was 
why are people so passionate about railroads, or at least some people? And so the first segment I thought would be important to establish is uh, why the historians that I interviewed and who are included and who helped me with this program, why they cared about railroads. So it's for love of trains is the first uh, first segment. It runs about uh, five minutes, uh, so five and a half minutes. So um, if I can uh, uh, competently share my screen with you, we'll we'll run through that unless there's uh, anything I need to hear from anyone beforehand. No? Okay. So give me a minute. minute takes a few little things to do here. Sometimes it seems like they're uh, living things. They pant and they puff and they uh, seem to breathe almost. They're impressive, they're massive. When I was younger, I couldn't think of a, a better thing to do than to be a railroad engineer. I've always been kind of sorry that that never happened, <laughs> but uh, it never did. The real beginnings started in Europe. I mean, it was very, very early trains used for mining coal in England and so forth. The French made great strides in steam locomotives, uh, but it wasn't very long. You know, it's just like any new idea. It all kind of comes about at the same time. And it wasn't long before in this country, there was a very few spots where steam locomotives started. And one of them, of course, was right up here in between Albany and Schenectady with the, the Mohawk and Hudson Railroad. Many of the early railroads were between waterways because waterways were the uh, transportation of the time. There was a great belief that wherever a railroad ran, financial success would follow. If you look at the success of the Erie Canal, which was the first of the, of the, of the great canal systems, many, many states wanted to emulate that. They thought, well, gosh, here's, here's the key to wealth and industrial development. And uh, I think the same thing happened with the railroad, but even more so because the country had grown quite a bit more. interested in the railroading because of my father. He was an engineer back in the steam engine days. And my grandfather was an engineer on the UND. And I had a great uncle that was an engineer on the UND. But I started with my father. He would take me on the job. And I was king just sitting up there. I was like five years old back in the 40s. He'd take me down to Weehawken or up to Selkirk or on the Walk Hill Valley, or even up the UND. He worked out at Kingston, and so he had different jobs all over. But he basically worked for the West Shore. And my grandfather he hired out on the UND in 1923. He retired in 1956. So I, I, I rode with him, and he was basically the mountain on the UND from Kingston to Oneonta. And then we'd lay over in the Oneonta station, 
and they had a, like a bunk room in, in the baggage department. And then we'd ride back. It took one day up and one day down. It's when the branch lines were operating, and I knew all the crews. I knew them through my father, and he was called Big Jake, and I was Little Jake. <laughs> And then uh, I got where I, I went by myself. I didn't have to just ride with my dad. When the steam engines were starting to go, I wanted to get some pictures of my father when he was running the steam engines. So I got the old family Kodak, the box cameras. You look down through like this, took some shots. They weren't like that great. That's how I basically got started taking pictures. That must be the, uh, the journalist in me who was always like people in the pictures. Rail fans didn't want people in the pictures, but I always, always liked people in the pictures. When I worked on the steam engines in Middletown and the Connecticut, I was always on the engines, always on the steam engines, firing, sometimes running. I was an extra engineer. That's where it really came in, that you had all this power. All you had to do was pull a throttle <laughs> or shovel coal, a lot of shoveling coal. Okay, so that's the uh, the first segment. I don't know if there are any questions or thoughts about it. Always eager to hear comments. And I'll just say there were several historians who gave uh, gave me a lot of their time. Uh, Bill Helmer, who's no longer with us, uh, was key. Uh, and of course, railroad history, as is explained, is an old history. So there were uh, lots of uh, a variety of media that I had to kind of wrangle to put this together. Uh, some contemporary footage that, uh, that you've seen, as as well as old uh, drawings and, and such from the nineteenth uh, uh, century. So it's it's a matter of of kind of corralling all these materials that illustrate what the historians and other people have have said. So the the uh, the program is basically built around the narrative track as I've collected it. And in this case, uh, as in some of my other films, there's no real narrator. All of the the narrative elements come from the historians themselves. I don't have a, the voice of God in it, although some of my, my films uh, have used that technique as well. So I'll leave it open for any questions. Okay. Any questions right now? A Gail? Uh, you need a, yeah, there you go. Oh, Toby, thank you so much for your work. It, it truly looks like it is a labor of love. Uh, it's just stunning, exciting. Uh, my husband was an engineer um, on the, uh, he went to we Weehawken to Selkirk. And nice. uh, yeah, yeah, for quite a while. And he really enjoyed that. So he's enjoying this. Um, the fact that you picked Utah Phillips for your music at the beginning I, I say, was, I'm Utah. sorry, say that again. Oh, the fact that you chose Utah Phillips to sing. That was my choice. Well, well no, that, that wasn't oh, mine. That was, that, that was the that was the historic society. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. A, yeah. a real a total favorite. Um, and, and you do have to listen to the track Moose Turd Pie. Has anybody ever heard that? Funny, funny story that Utah Phillips tells. And he also talks about Gandhi dancing. Just oh yeah, some facts. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, I was able to uh, to uh, use really kind of uh, uh, Hudson Valley Catskill Mountain musicians and music. Uh, if you watch the whole thing, you'll find some songs that that really relate directly to this neck of the woods. Uh, and so I was very lucky with uh, Paul Lansbury and uh, Dick Staber uh, to uh, to get some of their music to use, and it was a uh, a real lucky find on my part that that the, the music basically already existed. I didn't have to ask any of our musician friends to compose anything. So that was yeah. kind of an, a, an, an easy way out, if you will. Nice job. It really finishes it off nicely. Thank, Thank you. you. Toby, um, Troy Ellen Dixon sent a, co a, a comment in the chat. Uh, does your documentary include information about the Delaware and Hudson line? It does mention it. Um, the uh, because I, I'm dealing with basically the northern and southern Catskills, and the Delaware and Hudson, as I recall, is kind of skirts the northern part of the Catskills. But it is mentioned, especially when it when it uh, has to do with with hauling coal, which was such a big part of the railroad uh, business uh, back in the day. So, yes. 
Short answer is yes. Okay. Anything else before we go on to the next segment? Okay, let's go on, Toby. Okay, let's uh, see how this uh, works. Yep, that's not right. Where did we go? Pardon me. Okay, this is where we want to go. Hold on. And Toby, we're seeing your floating uh, Zoom control bar for some reason. So yeah. I don't know if you want to move it out of the way, slide it out, because then we're not seeing some of the, the titling. Okay. So th this is a, a segment of that about uh, really before the railroads, as was mentioned in the earlier segment, the canals were an important part. Of course, the Delaware and, Hud Delaware and Hudson Canal is an important um, industry in this neck of the woods. Uh, so there's a short segment on on kind of before the railroads, kind of setting the, the stage for the introduction of the railroads. What a terrible storm we had one night on the D&H Canal. Oh, the D&H was a-rising, and the gin was a-getting short. And I scarcely think I'll get a drink till I get to Phillips Port. Get to Phillips Port. Well, three days out of Honesdale, the vessel struck a shoal. We liked to all been fat. Foundered on a chunk of Lackawanna coal. Oh, the D&H was a-rising, and the gin was a-getting short. And I scarcely think I'll get a drink till I get to Phillips Port. Get to Phillips Port. Now the captain, he came up on deck with a spyglass in his hand. And the storm it was so doggone thick that he couldn't spy the land. Oh, the D&H was a-rising, and I need me a glass of swell. And I scarcely think I'll get a drink till I get to Eddyville. Get to Eddyville. The Delaware and Hudson Canal ran between Honesdale, Pennsylvania, and Kingston for anthracite coal to get coal to New York. Getting coal to New York and coal seagoing ports and so forth was the major catalyst that brought about the railroads. The canal came in at Eddyville, and, uh, which was just up the creek from Rondout. Rondout had large storage areas and was a distribution point for ocean going and ports up and down the, the seaboard. Rondout very gradually became quite a significant uh, center for uh, maritime interests. At one time it had the Cornell Steamboat Company, which was a, a logical outgrowth from the canal. Cornell had great connections you know, through relatives as well as friends with the Delaware and Hudson Canal. And it was largely through his canal background that he got started in a towing business. And he built it up into one of the largest towing operations in the world. So just very briefly, that's a little bit of the canal story. Uh, and of course, Cornell became a very big player in the railroad business as well. Uh, and uh, he and, uh, and his son-in-law, Samuel Decker Kirkendall uh, were basically the, the main powers behind the Ulster Delaware Railroad. And there's a segment later on I'll play uh, you, which is a uh, one of the longer segments, about a 12 minute segment about the kind of the last years of the Ulster and Delaware. The way I built up the Ulster and Delaware program was before the Ashokan Reservoir was built and after the Ashokan Reservoir was built because they had to move their track uh, during that time out of what is now the really the basin of the of the uh, Ashokan. So uh, we'll get to that a little later. I don't know if there are any questions about the about the canals there. Of course, the DNH Canal Museum is an important place to visit, and you can see some of the locks that are that are uh, approachable. Any, any questions? questions? Any questions? I guess we can move on. Okay. 
I know that as far, I know Chester Hartwell knows a lot about this stuff. So I don't know if he has anything to say. Hi, Chester. Anyway. Hi, Toby. <laughs> Greetings. Um, we will uh, get, go on, I guess, uh, to the next one, which is a, an interesting story of the Otis elevating and the Catskill Mountain Railway, which came out of Catskill and ran up to uh, close to the mountaintop and uh, and to service the the grand hotels of the Northern Catskills, uh, one in particular, the Catskill Mountain House, and it has a, a kind of interesting story. So um, it, it's interesting to me that some of these stories, for, for instance, about this dovetail with some of my other history films that I've done. I did a film called The Catskill Mountain House in the World Around, which of course centers on the, on the grand hotels of the Northern Catskills. Uh, and the railroad story is part of that film as well. So um, although there's kind of a, uh, a repetitive theme, if you will, I think the material is, is different enough that it, that it stands up in both of, the, both of the films. So unless there's anything else, we'll move along to that segment. Okay. This is not the way it's supposed to be. I'm sorry. Bear with me. Where did we go? Okay. You haven't shared anything with us, Toby? I'm sorry? You haven't shared your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Let's hold on. Hold on. I'm sorry. In the 19th century, one of the most famous mountain hotels in the world was the legendary Catskill Mountain House. The hotel stood on the precipice of the Catskill Escarpment at an elevation of nearly 2,300 feet, some 13 miles west of the Hudson River port of Catskill. In the late 1870s, Charles L. Beach, who was the owner of the Catskill Mountain House, heard that there was going to be a new mammoth hotel constructed in the proximity of his famed establishment, and he was really quite worried. Uh, he was also extremely concerned about Thomas Cornell's plan to build a railroad from Phoenicia that would bring passengers directly to the rival hotel Carter scale. To counter this new railroad line, Beach decided to build his own railroad. And in 1882, he built a line from Catskill west to the base of the Catskill Escarpment near Palinville. And this new line was called the Catskill Mountain Railway. A year later, the railroad was extended into Palinville. And soon after that, to the bustling town of Carroll. Uh, the business from Carroll to Catskill was substantial enough to run the line year-round, while the rest of the Catskill Mountain system ran only during the summer months. This trip on the Catskill Mountain Railway from Catskill to the bottom of the mountain beneath the famed old mountain house was relatively easy. It was a rail trip that took approximately 45 minutes, and people seemed quite happy riding in these coaches. However, when they arrived at the Mountain House station, they had to get stagecoaches, surreys, and wagons, or any other means of transportation that would take them up the mountain turnpike to the hotel. The road was bad, it was bumpy, and it was uncomfortable in good weather, and downright nasty when the weather didn't cooperate. My grandfather was telling me a story that when he was a young man, that was one of his jobs, was driving that stagecoach. And he said, you get halfway up the mountain, there was a, a kind of a way station where you could get water for the horses, and there was a big rock and had a, an indentation, looked like a footprint. He was like, to all the passengers out of New York City, that's Rippin' Winkle's footprint right there. And it, really? Beach, in his wisdom, realized that this was a real problem for him. So he went to the people who owned the Otis Elevator Company, Yonkers, New York, 
and asked them to help design a funicular railroad that would connect Mountain House Station at the base of the mountain with a new station to be called Otis Summit the Top, which was about 600 feet from his Catskill Mountain House. The engineering to build the Otis Elevating Railway was really quite remarkable. It had two long wooden trestles, one approximately a quarter of a mile long, and the one at the bottom was nearly a half mile long. People were quite terrified of this, but still it allowed them to get from the bottom of the mountain to the summit in less than 15 minutes instead of the torturous two to four hour trip that it often took by stagecoach. After the Otis opened in 1892, Beach finally had a direct route to his hotel, and this in essence saved his business. Otis is a fascinating railroad. If you looked at nothing but the braking systems that were used to protect it from coming down a 40 plus percent incline, if they had rails at the bottom, they probably could have made it to the river, right, if there was nothing in the way. But they had some very creative uh, braking systems. There were five ways to stop it. The uh, operator at the top where the drums folded the cable and rewound them, he could stop it at that point. Each car was held by two cables, and if one of the cables distended, or just broke, flat out broke, it would cant like this and the other cable would be pulled forward and then sharp pieces of steel would drop and bite into those pieces of oak and bring the car to a stop. If you read the newspaper advertisements about it when they built it, the Otis folks said, these braking systems will bring the cars to a safe and smooth stop. And I thought, I'm gonna buy safe, but I'm not sure I'm buying smooth. You know, steel biting in suddenly. 12 miles an hour was the maximum. If it exceeded that, then these poles were implemented and brought in, spun out centrifugally and into the oak. But you imagine from 12 to zero in this distance, probably got somebody's attention in the car, right? At the top of the mountain, the Otis had a coal-fired power station with a big powerhouse with bull wheels and cables around them. At each end of the cable, there was attached a passenger car. These cars went up and down the mountain as counterweights much like you'd find in a cuckoo clock. And these would bypass each other right in the middle, one going up and one going down. Once the Otis was completed, Charles Beach realized that his railroad was only a mile from Cornell's narrow gauge railroad that terminated near the Hotel Carterskill at South Lake. Beach determined it would make sense to connect these two railroads and give him through service to Haynes Falls, Tannersville, and the mountaintop communities that lay to the west. Now passengers could come from Catskill, west to Palinville and up the Otis, and continue west on the Catskill and Tannersville line and connect with Cornell's Ulster and Delaware system at Carterskill Junction. Or they could come by way of Phoenicia and get directly to the Otis Summit and the Catskill Mountain House. The agreement between Beach and Cornell lasted until 1898, when the Ulster and Delaware Railroad decided they were going to standard gauge the entire narrow gauge railroad system. With that, the Ulster and Delaware canceled their agreement with Beach and they terminated service to Otis Summit. This left Mr. Beach with a one mile long narrow gauge railroad that went absolutely nowhere. With this in mind, he extended the Catskill and Tannersville Railroad approximately four miles through Haynes Falls to the village of Tannersville. The Catskill and Tannersville ran parallel to and sometimes immediately alongside the old Ulster and Delaware. This narrow gauge line tried valiantly to offer an alternative route to the mountaintop her colorful employees were to become local legends. The late day train might stop and let passengers disembark to enjoy a view of the Carterskill Falls. On certain occasions, the engineer would even stop and let passengers pick the local blueberries, called huckleberries, thus giving the railroad its nickname, the huckleberry. Although these memorable tales endure about this novel narrow gauge railroad, the Catskill and Tannersville didn't survive the economic downturn of World War I and completely shut down after the summer season of 1918. In 1919, the entire Catskill railway system was abandoned and sold for scrap. There's no whistle in the Glen anymore, anymore. No railroad men to wave to from the old cabin door. They rode the narrow gauge way back in the Gilded Age. From Palinville down to the Hudson Shore. So there you have it. Uh, the Otis is an interesting uh, thing. If you go to Palinville now and look up the mountain and you see where the electric lines run, 
that's the path of the old Otis. So you can get a sense of, of the kind of uh, climb that it took uh, to get to the mountaintop on that uh, cog railway. Um, uh, I've been told, and I don't know if this is still happening, that the folks in uh, in Beacon are trying to resurrect or perhaps have resurrected a, a railroad, a similar kind of system that went up to Mount Mount Beacon. Uh, and maybe someone knows uh, more about that uh, current status, of course. So many things uh, ground to a halt the last couple of years. I don't know what's going on there. Um, thoughts or questions about the Otis and the Catskill Mountain Railway? Okay. Or Mr. Uh, Beach. Okay, Joan Kelly. Okay, I, I think the photographs you have are fascinating. And I, I wasn't aware that movies were available as early as they are. Do you have any idea what the date is on some of those movies that were taken of the train rides? And where yeah. do you find those? <laughs> The, the, it's, uh, the films came from the Library of Congress, and they, they are all available online. You can actually find them if you do a little searching for them on the Library of Congress site. Um, I would have to look back and see the exact dates of those particular films. Uh, it, it really is fascinating that someone wrote up the Otis to, to see where, they, where the two uh, uh, cars passed each other lucky for us that that the film exists uh and as well as coming down and, and coming to a stop at the bottom uh you know early 1900s um they they were shooting edison and biograph and and folks were were out doing um these kind of things they they basically let the let the world uh, kind of unfold in front of the camera uh for the, for the early days before they started figuring out how they could tell stories as well. Uh, some of which were shot on railroad tracks around here, the you know, uh, uh, great train robbery kind of things were supposedly happening in Colorado and they were shot on the, on the uh, outside of Phoenicia. So, so those kind of things, uh, uh, filmmakers were inventive. And uh, yeah, lucky for us, there were some beautiful uh, glass negatives that existed uh, and again, uh, Library of Congress has some uh, local collectors like uh, John Hamm and uh, Eugene Downer were very generous with their collections. Uh, John Hamm is the premier uh, railroad historian and collector of of images uh, in the in the Catskills and the Hudson Valley, um, and he puts out uh, books uh, regularly. He just one did one recently. I I know. So if you're really interested in wonderful. Uh, pictures and great stories in book form. Uh, look for John's uh, ha uh, John Ham's books. Uh, they often go out of print, so they're sometimes hard to find. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, Gail. Um, I'm curious, Toby. Why did it go from narrow gauge to standard gauge? Well, the standard gauge was just as it says. That was kind of the the usual gauge of of tracks uh, and. The Ulster and Delaware, and of course, it's cheaper to do narrow gauge. So the, a lot of railroads uh, started out that way, or some did, certainly. Uh, and the Ulster and Delaware had a narrow gauge system that that went from Phoenicia to the mountaintop and standard gauge coming into Phoenicia, coming out of out of Kingston. So they had a, a very interesting and uh, transfer system where they had to they literally uh, let the uh, narrow gauge uh, track a uh, wheel system fall out from underneath the, the cars they were carrying and the cars were then slid onto a, uh, a standard gauge uh, uh, car and hooked up to an engine to continue on its way. So they decided it was, it made sense. They had enough uh, traffic that they would standard gauge the whole thing to make it a lot easier for them uh, dealing with freight and with passengers in Phoenicia. So they did that. Uh, and there's also some thought that uh, there was such a great um, competitiveness between Cornell's folks and uh, Beach, who ran the Catskill Mountain Railway, that this was a way to kind of stop Beach in his tracks and um, make him less, uh, less uh, profitable. So 
Beach had to counteract it with uh, extending his uh, his line uh, further west. Uh, but as the uh, narration says, as John Hamm says, uh, that didn't last forever because it was just not competitive. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and Any I can't tell you the, the, okay. the, the particulars of, of the size of standard gauge and narrow gauge. I don't have in my head. Uh, there are particular uh, distances uh, between the wheels. And it, I think it, it, it stems, uh, if my history is at all correct, uh, has to do with the, the width of Roman chariots and, and, and roads in England and then railroads in England and then transferred to, the, to other parts of the world. I don't know if I'm exactly right with that, but I know it it has some history like that. Uh, the other thing I'll just say, I don't claim to be a historian. I'm kind of a popularizer of, of other people's histories, if you will. Uh, and I'm always uh, really building on the on the shoulders and on the uh, on the backs of, of people who've done the the really deep research and they're so generous to share it with me and with our viewers. Okay, then shall we move along, Toby? Sure. Uh, there's one more segment, which is uh, of the Ulster and Delaware, uh, in what I call in the later years, uh, after the uh, uh, the Ashokan Reservoir was built. And let's see if we can find it again. I'm sorry, this is not hooked up the way it should be. Let's see. Bear with me, I'll share this. So this runs about uh, 12 minutes uh, and I think it'll be of interest. In the early 1900s, New York City acquired a huge mass of land west of Kingston to construct a 130 billion gallon 40 square mile reservoir. Right through the middle of this was the old Ulster in Delaware and New York City had to buy them out. This was a 12 mile section of track with six stations. And after much arguing, a price of a million and a half dollars was settled upon as a final sale price. Immediately thereafter, the Ulster in Delaware built a brand new railroad about a mile north of the original route between West Hurley and Boyceville. By 1913, the completed Ulster in Delaware was a first-class railroad. Full trains of parlor cars were often seen on the Stony Cove branch, and through cars ran daily to and from New York, Philadelphia, and even Washington, D.C. The Stony Cove branch was a prime source of passenger revenue, as so many of the mountain hotels lay along its route. The railroad's high year for earnings was 1913, when 755,000 tons of freight and 676,000 passengers poured well over a million dollars into the Ulster and Delaware's coffers. Within the city limits of Kingston, there were five different stations on the Ulster and Delaware. At Kingston Point, Ronda, which of course was original right back to the Ronda in Oswego, the Union Station right there where the, at the West Shore Crossing, and the Walk Hill Valley came in there too. Then you had another station, the Fair Street Station. It was there until 1898. They also had a station at Washington Avenue, and that was known as Higginsville Station. So they had five stations. Rondout had a roundhouse and a turntable and their shops where they could tear their steam locomotives right down to every nut and bolt and rebuild them. The Ulster in Delaware earned a tremendous amount of money from the shipment of milk that was processed in the creamers that were located along the line. Almost all of them were in Delaware County. There were no creamers in Ulster County. There was one creamery in Greene County and that was at Hunter. Most of the milk cars that were used on the Ulster in Delaware and on the New York Central after they took it over were owned by the milk companies. They had uh, numerous lumber mills throughout the Catskills that used the railroad for shipping their product. The Fenwick Lumber Company in Edgewood was the largest lumber uh, operation in the Catskills, and it provided most of the lumber for the construction of the Ashokan Reservoir, which was millions of board feet, which was shipped out by the railroad. They also had a large coal transporting business from the coal mines in Pennsylvania that came to Oneonta and were shipped to Rondau and placed on boats and shipped to New York City. But probably the coal business was the largest revenue producer other than passengers that the Ulster and Delaware had. And this operation of coal lasted 
almost to the 1930s. The Ulster and Delaware connected at Phoenicia where they connected with the Stony Cove branch of their own railroad and at Arkville, which connected with the Delaware Northern Railway. And that was a railroad that ran from Arkville to East Branch where it connected with the New York, Ontario and Western. So you, you could make a circuitous route around the Catskills and, and ride most anywhere on most any railroad and get back to the same place. The Ulster and Delaware Railroad was very successful. Even up through the early parts of the World War One, they survived that very well. They came through up to the 1920s, they got through the 1920s, they had over $3 million surplus, and the railroad was going fine because they were making money, everybody was happy until the powers to be on the Ulster and Delaware Railroad and the stockholders took every bit of that money that was the surplus and they declared a one-time dividend for the stockholders and completely broke the railroad. Passenger traffic declined through the early 1930s as the hotels burned one by one. The most crippling loss for the Stony Clove branch happened in September of 1924 when a giant hotel Carterskill, the line's major customer, went up in flames. At the end of the Ulster and Delaware period, there was a court case, kind of like an under-the-table payment of money at the time that the Ashokan Reservoir was built. It was a significant amount of money and it was divided up amongst the stockholders at the time. This was kept in ignorance of the banks that had mortgages on the railroad. So when the time came to get rid of the railroad and everything tanked as business-wise, of course it went down the tubes and the banks took a loss. Somewhere along the lines, the banks found out about this money and they said, we want that money. And the courts did give it to them. The Kirkendall family they were no slouches when it came to bringing out the big guns. They had the law firm of Hughes, Sherman, and Dwight. Hughes is in Charles Evans Hughes, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, but he still lost. 1913 figures for the Ulster and Delaware were the high figures in its history. And after that, everything started to decline. And the automobile was the reason why, because the roads started to be built better. Everybody wanted an automobile. By the 19... 20s, it was going down significantly. By the 1930s, they were looking for a way out. The New York Central purchased the Ulster and Delaware, but they had to purchase it. They were forced to purchase it through a decision from the Interstate Commerce Commission, which by then was in place regulating everything. And the lawyers for the Ulster and Delaware sought to have their railroad included in this mega merger that was taking place at the time. The New York Central and what was known as the Big Four Railroad out in Indiana and Ohio. So New York Central took over the entire operation. They wanted to get rid of the branch line for years, but the branch line from Phoenicia to Hunter and to Cordeskill made money for them every year. So what they did in 1937, they went and they put all new heavy rails in through the line, made it a big up-to-date railroad, and then they used that cost to show a loss. So in 1938, they lost money. Then they applied to the Interstate Commerce Commission to abandon the railroad, and they let them do it. Pretty cool manipulation by the New York Central, if I do say so. The last passenger train left Hunter for Phoenicia on September 9th, leaving the branch with only an occasional freight train. After the required Public Service Commission hearings, the New York Central finally obtained an order of abandonment in January of 1940. Trains to the Greene County Catskills were no more. Although the branch from Phoenicia to the mountaintop had been abandoned, the New York Central continued service along the main line from Kingston to Oneonta. The New York Central ran the steam locomotives all the way up through the 1940s, but they were getting old. They couldn't provide new ones for the line that were going to be efficient. They did what every other railroad did. They were forced into dieselization. It was totally dieselized by the end of 1948. They upgraded bridges, they made the line stronger so it could hold the heavier locomotives, and by the end of uh, 1948, the steam locomotives in the Catskill Mountains were history. The line plotted along, running diesel locomotives, up until the passenger service was discontinued in 1954. The New York Central ran the railroad, of course, from Kingston to Oneonta, all years until 1965 they abandoned the line back from Oneonta to Bloomville 
Well, that was beginning at the end of the railroad because you could tell once it was just a one-way railroad, there was no traffic on the other end. So it was just haul cars in and haul cars out. But Penn Central took it over, and the interests that were running the Penn Central Railroad were very, very slanted toward Pennsylvania interests. So they allowed a lot of the smaller lines in New York State to become abandoned. They let this one go in such condition that there's some numerous wrecks that finally, in 1976, the uh, state gave them permission to abandon the line, and they did. Penn Central couldn't get rid of it. It took the Conrail merger to set that up so that they could abandon it because there were so many railroads involved with Conrail, and Conrail says, we're not going to run this thing. We started out in Kingston, we got in the taxi cab, we went to Stanford. The engine was up to Stanford and everything was all ready. We cleaned Agway out and whatever cars was in Stanford. Then we went down to Roxbury. We had to clean Dick Lutz out Roxbury there. And then it was coming back from there. I figured we had to make Pine Hill. We had two loads out of Fleischmann's before we went up the hill. But we had to make the hill top of the hill because there was no room to go up to stick anything because that was the cars that all the empties that they brought out a week before. So we got up to High Mount, and then we put all the train together, the 34 cars, and started working our way home with them. It was an event, you might say. And we painted this big sign that says, Farewell. And the train crew couldn't get over all the people that were Oh, last train. Going back to my Catskill Mountain home. When I get there, I'll never more roam. I'll ride the rails no more. I'll sit right by the door on the porch of my Catskill Mountain home. Out behind the caboose, I can see Mount Peekamoose reaching way up in the sky. And like a ten wheel boom boost that's no longer in use, I'm coming back home now to die. Each night in my dreams, a bright headlight beams through the tunnel. It shines like a sun And I patiently wait For a slow-moving freight To take me on my final run Going back to my Catskill Mountain home When I get there I'll never more roam I'll ride the rails no more I'll sit right by the door On the porch of my Catskill Mountain home When the Copenhagen train pulled out of the station It sounded something like this The only rail lines that are in the Catskills is the CSX line up the old west shore. And the closest one to the south of us, of course, is the old Erie line, which is part of Norfolk Southern. And then, of course, there's the Delaware and Hudson, which skirts the Catskills to the north. But there are no rail connections into the Catskill Mountains itself anywhere. The Ontario and Western is gone. The Ulster and Delaware is gone. The Delaware and Northern is gone. They're all gone. They're all gone. Well, just about uh, the only railroad in the Catskills that's operating at the moment, I believe, is the Catskill Mountain Railroad, which is a tourist train out of Kingston that runs along, basically alongside of uh, Route 28 going west, uh, as far as uh, Stony Hollow, basically, right now. And uh, uh, the film uh, details kind of the, the struggle that they went through uh, as the uh, uh, the Ashokan Rail Trail was uh, being uh, considered and uh, began uh, being built. Um, 
And so that story continues. Uh, but the Ulster and Delaware is gone and all these other ones are, are gone. But folks still love their trains. So that's why you're all here. Any, any questions and thoughts? I'm happy to hear. I'll ask if anyone here has been on the Catskill Mountain Railroad uh, train from Kingston. They they run, uh, of course, they kept running through the through the pandemic time. They've been able to run at reduced ridership and a lot of open cars. Uh, this season, they are doing their their Christmas runs. Uh, I know they keep they keep uh, keep uh, trains going. Uh, they celebrate a lot of the holidays on the line. Uh, if you have little kids, it's a great thing to take them on. And uh, if you love trains, it may be uh, one of the few chances around here you'll get. So it's pouring here, by the way. I don't know if it's raining there. We had some thunder and a little flickering. So hopefully we won't lose our power. Any questions? Uh, hi, yeah. The, uh... I took a um, Alaska cruise and in Skagway, I took a, a, um, the narrow gauge uh, train up one of the routes that the 49ers took going up, <laughs> up into the mountains there. And uh, Gene Donner told me when I got back to, back to Kingston that, th that there were many, some of the um, narrow gauge uh, cars were uh, bought out by the Skagway uh, group. So lots of times while the railroads go away, a lot of their remnants, you know, still still are in service other places for other reasons. Right. That, that's true. It's true. I heard that story also that uh, some of the narrow gauge equipment's up in Alaska. So that's interesting. Uh, the uh, other thing I'll mention is for uh, people who like all things rail is uh, Remember, there's a wonderful trolley museum in Kingston as well, down in the Rondout. And they have a, a, I don't know what they're doing as far as running trains right now uh, or running trolleys, but uh, they have a nice run that goes out to Kingston Point, which was the site of that great amusement park back in its heyday. So, uh, Lewis has a comment or question. Hi, Toby. Thanks very much. Great, great. I, I would uh, be very interested in getting the whole documentary and listening to the whole thing. Um, Thank one, you. Quick, one quick question. Um, early on in your presentation, we were looking at canals that predated the, the, the railroad lines. Were those canals built in the same time period as the Erie uh, that uh, connected the Mohawk across the Northern New York? Was that the same Basic, yeah, basically the same time period. Uh, when they, I think they saw the success of the Erie uh, a lot of people who wanted to make some money decided, well, we should do this, too. And, of course, there was a great need for coal out of uh, Pennsylvania to get to the eastern markets. So that's why the the Delaware and Hudson Canal was successful as long as it was. Of course, the problem with canals is when you have a drought, you don't have any water. And in the winter, things freeze up. So the railroads were a real boom to the, that kind of commerce. Uh, and it was much more reliable than, even though there are accidents and such, but it, oh, overall, it's much more reliable than depending on water in a canal. So, right. sure. yeah, Thank you. And, and the canal is a great story because uh, uh, they use mules and uh, some uh, children were uh, in charge of the mules. You can see some of the pictures. Uh, it's well worth the while to go to the uh, uh, canal house, uh, the uh, also, Delaware and Hudson Canal Museum House. They've got great exhibits and a wealth of information. And that's located in Kingston. High Falls. The, the, High, High Falls. Falls. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you very much. Jack posted something in the chat. I don't know if everybody's looking there. Um, that the Kingston um, Railroad Club on Ann Street behind the YMCA might be having open houses on weekends this month. And okay. Joanne posted that the trolley museum is closed for the season and will open up again in the spring. And they're always looking for volunteers. Right. Uh, and there's also and a great maritime museum to, to just go on another historic uh, means of transportation. Of course, the great maritime museum in the Rondout as well is 
they have a lot of very active programs uh, going on, uh, boat building and all kinds of great things. And Peter wants to know um, how we can watch the whole film. The film is available, uh, as I say, on DVD. It's in some stores. You can order it from our website, which is Willow Mixed Media, uh, Willow like the tree, M-I-X-E-D media dot O-R-G. Uh, and you'll see a lot of films there, uh, as well as uh, you can uh, stream it uh, on Vimeo, V-I-M-E-O, Vimeo On Demand. Uh, that's an app that you can have on your Roku or your Apple TV or whatever uh, device you use if you want to watch things in your in the comfort of your living room, or you can watch it on your computer or your, your cell phone. So uh, it's available both as a DVD and streaming online. And, and Chester if, has the and, hand and, up. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of the stores that that carry my my films. The uh, uh, Hurley Mountain, the Hurley Country Store in Old Hurley, uh, Olive's Country Store in uh, Shokan, uh, the Nest Egg in Phoenicia, uh, Cheese Louise in Town of Kingston. Uh, that's some uh, my uh, my later my last film. Uh, which is called Mountain River about the Esopus Creek is also available at the Esopus Creel fishing shop on Route 28. If you're uh, an angler, you might stop in and see uh, see their great array of flies and tackle and what have you and find one of our DVDs there. Okay, Chester, um, we need uh, to unmute. Okay, there you go. Yeah, I just checked the Casco Mountain Railroad uh, site, and they're not doing the Polar Express this year. No, no Polar Express, but they do have a, uh, I thought, a Christmas train uh, of their own, uh, not as elaborate as the Polar Express, which was, which was quite something, a lot of fun. We went on it, I think, three different times with our grandkids, and it was always fun. So... Okay, I think, Jeff, back to you for closing remarks, perhaps. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks a lot. I am old enough that I do remember the romance of, of going coast to coast on a uh, train when I was four years old and what it was like to go through the Rocky Mountains uh, on a, just a small wedge you know, uh, uh, a few thousand feet above the uh, the floor, and uh, it's truly amazing. You know what what we've lost in certain ways by the loss of trains, because um, they they were special. Also, my introduction to Kingston was by the New York Central weekends. I'd, I'd go up either to Peekskill to my aunt or to friends at Bard College when I was in high, high school. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's quite, it was quite an interesting way to ride. And my favorite person, uh, Nathaniel Booth, uh, who I've often quoted in many instances, in 1850, he was acutely aware of uh, the railroad, the completion of the train to Albany from New, New York. And he documented about the uh, incredible experience of having a business deal go uh, sour in the middle of New Jersey and being able to get on the train here in uh, Rhinecliff and go all the way to central New Jersey and back in one day which for a man who first, uh, you know, came of age with uh, sloops, uh, that, was, that was quite an adventure where it used to take a week uh, just to go down to New York and come back. Uh, now he could go to the middle of New Jersey in one day and back again. So it's, 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 it's really an amazing story. And, then, and another thing I'm thrilled about is with these rail trails, while well, I know there's a lot of uh, um, contention between the rail trail people and the, and the railroad people, at least on the 28 cor corridor, um, it really is amazing when you see all the trails to um, grasp just 
how much equipment was out there and, and what kind of access the people in some pretty remote areas uh, suddenly had uh, to be able to get you know, great distances um, by getting on the train in their little uh, hometowns, like, you know, the Accord station, and they could go anywhere in the uh, United States by the, uh, you know, the later 19th century. So I, I thank you, to Toby, for bringing this uh, film here, and I hope we all um, uh, appreciate more the uh, little railroad stations dotting the countryside of Ulster County and really the legacy that that uh, rail has uh, left be behind for us. So thanks again and thanks to everyone for coming on to the conference this evening. And uh, if there's no more questions, I'll say good, good night. But Thank, thanks for having me. Appreciate it a lot. Uh, I'll just make one other comment about uh, the other side of the river and Rhinecliff and stations along that line. Of course, uh, a lot of the uh, uh, wealthy people had their own private stops on that line. So it was uh, quite possible to go from Rhinecliff to any place else in the country, thanks uh, partly to, to some very wealthy people. So, yeah. And they had private cars, of course, as well, a lot of them. So that was a, a very comfortable ride for them. So thank you again for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Okay. Be well, everyone. Take care. Take care now.